Tobias Elwood, you have just returned from a fraught situation in Ukraine. But before we get on to that in this interview, let's turn to the fairly fraught situation in domestic British politics. Can you talk us through your thought process in terms of being one of those who called for the Prime Minister's resignation? Yeah, it was to do with the ill-discipline that we saw. Partygate, I think it's been summed up as. It's that lack of focus, uh, a lot of clarity as to where we're going to take the country. We've got some big challenges coming over the horizon, both domestically and internationally. And the nation needs to be led at this difficult time. And we weren't seeing that from this government, from Number 10 and indeed from the Prime Minister. And it then became all the more difficult for ministers themselves to go out every day and to defend the government's record, which is why eventually you saw uh, ministers, I think up to 50 almost in one day, decide that's it, uh, we need change. Very different circumstances to when other prime ministers have departed uh, in office, because this was less to do with policy, more to do with the personality and style of government. And you talk about discipline there, because of course that's something that you yourself ran up against in the middle of this leadership contest. Can you talk us through exactly what happened there with the removal of the whip and your status now as an independent MP? Well, I'm sorry to have lost the whip. There was a requirement to get back for a vote of confidence in the Prime Minister. Unfortunately, bomb alerts at, uh, in uh, Moldova and then a runway melting. I think Luton Airport was in a bad situation. Apparently I should have factored that all in. I wasn't able to return. I missed the vote. I'm sorry I lost uh, the whip. I should say that uh, common sense prevailed through Graham Brady, the chair of the 1922 committee, to allow me to vote for Penny Morden. I made it clear how embarrassing it would look uh, given the fact I was the only one to lose the whip, even though a number of MPs were away at that point, uh, if Penny were to have lost by one. So I'm actually pleased that I was able to support Penny. Your candidate, Penny Mordaunt, has this week endorsed Liz Truss, saying that she's the person to provide the change that the party and the country needs to become the next Prime Minister. Do you share that view? Well, I think it's for every MP to make their own judgment on who they want to support. I would say on a more general basis, given that we've just been speaking about Boris Johnson and the absence of discipline, the absence of focus, this is a time for the party to recognise, as we choose a new leader, that isn't just people in Odessa, it's the nation here that is watching as well. There's been a little bit too much blue on blue for my liking. It's been rather unedifying. We need to focus on that vision. Uh, we need to recognise that the, it is a broad coalition of voters that we need to win the next general election, not just our party base. A lot of the policies that we're seeing being thrown you know, at our party to you know, gain support, to collect those critical votes uh, actually may not appeal to the wider electorate as a whole. There are difficult challenges out ahead. I hope that in the remaining few weeks we can look at those wider challenges rather than just what our base wants to hear. Our base actually, the party, wants to be led, not followed. Now, just finally on the question of leadership, of course, you suggested uh, at the start of this entire process that this could be an opportunity to return the United Kingdom to the single market of the European Union. Is that a view you still hold? Well, let's just take Brexit again, another one of those difficult issues that we're glossing over. Nobody dare touch the subject. It's toxic at the moment. And I think the nation as a whole doesn't see themselves as Brexiteers or Remainers. That is very much a Westminster bubble terminology. You know, Britain just wants us to get on with it. We're out the EU. We've distanced ourselves politically. But go down to the engine room and you'll see that this economic model that we currently have with Brexit could improve. That's all I'm suggesting it may not be that the Norwegian model would be for everybody, but I promise you that the next Prime Minister will be looking at this, even if they deny that they'll be doing so right now. So the next Prime Minister may well be looking at closer economic integration with the European Union, in your view? Well, well at the moment, it's costing us 4% of our GDP, this current model that we actually have at the moment. We can improve on that. We have big British businesses that are bumping into tariffs and regulations, and we've seen it over the last four years. As I say, it's costing us 4% of our GDP. That's 40 billion pounds to the, the, the Treasury every single year. We need that money. Boy, do we need that money right now. You know, the Conservative Party is known for fiscal discipline, to be able to, you know, run the purse strings well, to look after our economy. It does concern me that, uh, that uh, you've got Liz Truss wanting to borrow about 30 billion pounds in order to pay for an awful lot of tax cuts, that if you borrow more money, the cost of borrowing 
goes up. That means interest rates go, go up. That means inflation goes up as well. These are real consequences. We need to be focusing not on just tax cuts, which of course we love, but actually on growth and productivity. That's where I'd like to see the debate head. Sounds like you're leaning a little bit towards Rishi Sunak there, but let's move on to foreign policy because of course you have just been in Odessa where the eyes of the world have been really in terms of getting that grain out of Ukraine, a really quite precarious international agreement brokered in Turkey between the Ukrainians and the Russians. What was your view of that agreement? Will it hold up? Well, let's just connect the two big questions that you put to me today, which is domestic and now Ukraine, because they are interrelated. The, the cost of living crisis that we're experiencing here is directly consequential to the fact that grain cannot get out of Odessa. That is ground zero when it comes to the breadbasket of Europe, Ukraine, being able to feed not just its own country, but Africa and indeed Europe as well. Get that grain moving and then grain prices, food prices then drop. That affects the cost of living. You sort out Ukraine, oil and gas prices will lower as well. But the, there isn't a general plan. Absolutely, we're supporting the Ukrainian people and the armed forces. Britain is doing more so than other countries, absolutely. But there isn't a clear plan as to how we stand up to Russia. That is weaponizing grain. So this plan that's just been agreed in Turkey, I'm afraid Russia's calling the shots. It's their agenda. And what I discovered in Odessa is actually there's appetite for a UN General Assembly resolution. Let's get a coalition of the willing to actually guard the maritime passage so that we control those shipping lanes, not uh, Russia. My concern is that once about 70 ships that got caught up in Odessa prior to the start of the war, once they've departed with their grain, then Russia will have its sights on Odessa. For a long term, they wanted to actually take that city. It was part of the original Russia empire. That's where I think their campaign after Odessa will head next. We've gained confidence. We're you know, getting better at supporting Ukraine, but it's coming very, very late uh, in the day. And let's recognize we still see NATO sitting on its hands. This most formidable, potent military alliance the world has ever seen. There's a fire in Ukraine and we won't pull it out. And my concern is that fire will spread beyond Ukraine and we really will have to wake up. There's always risk when you take on an adversary, but there's also risk in doing nothing, allowing Russia to then not expand just in Ukraine. But where does it head to next? Prior to going to Odessa, I was in Moldova next door, not part of NATO, very small country, very limited armed forces. They feel very, very vulnerable indeed. Look what's going on in Bosnia right now and in Kosovo. You know, the stability in Eastern Europe is very precarious indeed. Why? Because Putin has recognized after our humiliating withdrawal from Afghanistan that this is his moment. He's backed up by China, don't forget. I see those two coalescing, this axis of Russia and China dominating the next 10, 20, 30 years. There is a danger when it comes to leaving Ukraine on its own and not leaning into it more. Not necessarily boots on the ground. There are many ways operationally, strategically, that we can support Ukraine. Let's not forget, we've got the head of the British Army here in the UK saying this is a 1937 moment. Look what happened there when we blinked. This week, we saw uh, an American strike in Kabul, in the heart of Afghanistan, taking out the leader of Al Qaeda. What does this say about the Western withdrawal from that area? President Biden will be pretty pleased to be able to take out somebody that was directly involved in that attack on the USS Cole in the 80s, on 9-11 as well. Pivotal, one of the architects in some of the challenges uh, that we've been facing over the last couple of decades encountering terrorism. But ultimately, it also reflects the perhaps of futility of us walking away from Afghanistan, the way that the Taliban is now back in cahoots with Al Qaeda. That's why we went into the country in the first place to actually defeat Al Qaeda. Al -Qaeda. And here they are growing again, becoming a potent force, once regrouping, rearming, retraining. That's what we're seeing and taking advantage of a safe haven of Afghanistan. Now, they can do this over the horizon ops, if you like, as they did with the CIA drone strike, but you can't do that and actually kill this ideology. I think Osama bin Laden, I'm afraid, would pro probably be pleased to see that since his creation of Al-Qaeda in the 1980s, that ethos, that philosophy, that extremism has now spread across the world, mostly in Africa now, certainly in the Middle East, back in Afghanistan, causing problems for the West itself. We still don't have an answer, you know, 20 odd, 20 odd years after 9-11 as to how to deal with somebody who then believes they, when they're indoctrinated that they're willing to take their lives thinking they're going to get a fast track to paradise because some extremist tells them that.
On a diplomatic level, how should the United Kingdom government engage with the Taliban? So I went out to meet the Taliban leadership in Doha, in Qatar, where they have uh, their main international base. I did this uh, a, a, a year ago, and it was very clear to me that they said privately that they hadn't got the ability to run a country. No chance whatsoever. We should recognize them. It's our fault that we handed power to them. Our uh, perhaps hesitance in wanting to support the Taliban means the 40 million people that we've abandoned are now seriously suffering because of famine, food shortages and so forth. Just finally, would that not risk legitimizing this terrorist adjacent state actor, legitimizing and indeed funding the very people who put our way of life at risk? That is the awful truth, the inconvenient you know, problem that you then face. But whose problem is that? Ours. We abandoned Afghanistan. We walked away. We handed it back to the very insurgents that we went into defeat. We've only got ourselves to blame there. We really need to wake up. We're entering very, very difficult times now, and there is simply not the international leadership. It really is like 1937. Absence of uh, international institutions to hold errant nations to account. Uh, uh, countries rearming, authoritarianism on the, on the rise, and no leadership, no you know, uh, Roosevelt. There's no Churchill there on the horizon to grasp this.